Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mari of Drea Renee Knits. I'm wearing Metamorphic and let's jump into some questions. I managed to delete one of the questions I wanted to answer. I I think I copied it to paste it into my list and then I must have gotten distracted with how I was arranging the questions and I never pasted it and I can't get it back. So I'm going to try my very best to paraphrase what the question was was um but yeah I'm so bummed I did that so if this was your question I am so sorry that I cannot read it properly but it's actually more of a personal question um if you have been tuning in to on if I want to um over the past year then you may have caught one of the episodes where I talk about my autoimmune diseases I have Hashimoto's and also celiac um, so this person had written in saying that they were recently diagnosed, I can't remember if it was an autoimmune disorder or a different chronic illness, um, and they're just having a hard time. It is those early days, they're having to spend a lot of time in bed, they have a young child, um, and just feeling overwhelmed with the forever feeling of their condition. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on that and say, you know, you're not alone. <laughs> um, I know for me, some of my harder days are dealing with the mental s repercussion of when I'm dealing with really bad chronic, f chronic fatigue or joint pain, um, low immunity, so I get sick a lot and different things like that. I think the mom guilt comes in really hard when I feel so exhausted and depleted and brain fog um, is a big one for me. And so I feel like I'm not as here as I want to be. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge everything you're feeling. I think that it's really normal to feel that way and um, I hope that maybe I can spread a little hope your way where a lot of times with these diagnoses, I remember when I was first diagnosed, they kind of told me I was gonna have to be on medication forever and it didn't feel like the most hopeful conversation with the doctor I was working with at that time. Um, but I do think that there are some things we can take into our own hands to try and improve um our day-to-day -day situation so for me that has been a journey into diet um, but also lifestyle so i um one of the main things that hashimoto's does is it will if you eat gluten it actually gluten and our thyroid um hormone are really really similar and so with Hashimoto's, your thyroid is attacked by your body. You start making antibodies and gluten can actually trigger that. And so for me, it was, it's definitely, and I have celiac. So it's very much tied to dietary stuff. Um, and inflammation, which I have a lot of inflammation in my body um, from Hashimoto's and I did from gluten before I knew I had celiac. Um, so dietary changes were really big for me and also the lifestyle. So I struggle to take care of myself and to like prioritize my health, especially running a business and having small children. Um, so trying to get proper sleep, that's kind of like top of the list for me. So I do think it's great that you are in bed when you need to be because if you just run yourself ragged and try to fight what your body's telling you, you're probably going to feel a lot worse and maybe make yourself sicker, maybe knock out your immune system, and then you'll be less available for your family and for the things you want to be able to do in your life. So I think that um, maybe seeing if there are any dietary triggers that could be um, adjusted for you to help your body. Um, that's a big one for me and rest is a big one um, and getting outside. But so to wrap that up too, I just wanted to say also finding your support system is really, really big. Again, I have a lot of guilt over it. 
Um, so having my partner, my spouse be supportive has been really fundamental because I feel like I always have to justify, um, depending on what your condition is too. A lot of us have like these invisible conditions where you can't, if you look at me, you probably think I'm like healthy and fine. And, um, so that can be really challenging too, is that fear that you won't be believed, which is also just common for women and, um, yeah. So, um, having a support system, having a doctor you trust and that you feel like really um, listens to you and acknowledges what you're feeling and what your symptoms are and a support system at home too is huge. Um, and try and, release, try and release your guilt because your health won't improve by beating yourself up over it. Um, so that's, that's been one for me to learn. So anyways, you're not alone. There's a lot of us out there and I hope that you do find some things that help you um, on a journey to a greater place of health, um, no matter what that might look like for you. All right, let's jump into some knitting. So, first knitting question. I have a question about folded neckbands and hems. Is it possible to modify a pattern that has a normal ribbed neckband into a folded neckband? How can I pick up the stitches for the neckband and turn them into a folded one? Thank you so much. So I totally, absolutely. Um, I am actually gonna link my, if it's a top down sweater, I'm gonna link my tutorial for, if it starts with the collar, um, how I do a folded neckband top down. I will say that that doesn't offer the same stability as one that's been picked up, um, but I think it's great to have the option. Um, but if you're picking up stitches, you're gonna pick up stitches just like you would have if you weren't gonna fold it. And all a folded neckband is, is knitting it twice as long as you want the finished neckband to be. And then you're just gonna fold it to the inside of the sweater and seam it down. Usually you can just use like a whip stitch uh, but you just seam it down. So yeah, just pick up those stitches per your dirt pattern, knit it twice as long, fold it in, and sew it down. And that's it. One thing to be careful of is for your bind off, take care that you don't bind off too tight. We never really want to bind off too tight, right? But uh, you want to be able to get that over your head. <laughs> so even when you're sewing it, um, make sure just give like a little stretch. It can be so tempting when we're seaming or sewing to like give a good tug. So I like to just kind of test my fabric as I go to make sure that I'm not overdoing it. Um, Cause you don't want to have to have, you know, you don't want trouble getting that over your head. All right, next question. I'm a fairly new knitter, but I love challenging myself. I'm ready to try my first color work project. What pattern would you recommend for an adventurous beginner to get into color work? I really love the shift cowl, but I'm intimidated by all the color changes. Um, so I actually think the shift cowl is a great one. It really depends on what kind of color work you're interested in. Are you interested just in color work in general and you kind of want to dip your toes into all the different kinds of color work because there's mosaic, stranded, um, intarsia. So there's a lot that can kind of fall under that category. Um, I do think that mosaic knitting can be a really nice stepping stone into, say, stranded color work because you don't have to juggle multiple strands of yarn at once. With mosaic knitting, you actually use slip stitches to create the motifs, and that's what the shift cowl is. So you're never juggling more than one color in a given row. You're, you'll use one back and forth, and then you'll use your other color back and forth. So I actually think that's a great place to start, and the shift cowl looks like there's all kinds of colors going on, but that's actually just the yarn is a color shifting variegated yarn. There's actually only three colorways in the shift cowl. Um, so to be honest, I think the trickier part of this cowl is probably the I-cord edge and the shaping. I don't think that the color work is too bad. Um, but if you are interested in mosaic, but this does still feel a little intimidating, then I would maybe try um, tincture. I have I have my a bin of like my accessories right here. I wonder if I have that. Sorry, crinkly bags. Let me see. I would have had this out if I were uh, you know a planner. 
Um, here is another, this is the Montana mountain cowl. This is also mosaic, but it's just knit in a tube. And so you might also like this as a beginner one uh, because there's no shaping. It's you, you don't have to increase or decrease with that one. Okay. Let's see. This big old, big old pile of knits. Maybe I don't have it right here. It should be. Oh, you know what would also be good is maybe the shift along hat. If you're interested in that style, wow, this could you tell I put my knits away so nicely last time I got in there. Um, but this is the same idea as the shift, but is knit in the round. And again, you won't deal with any shaping until the crown when you have to do your decreases. So I do think sometimes learning a new technique is nice in the round because you don't have to deal with back and forth. Oh, I found it. Here it is. So this is tincture. Um, so this is also mosaic knitting. So it uses slip stitches to make this herringbone pattern. It's this diagonal herringbone pattern. Um, so here we go. I will link these below. I'm gonna set them aside so I remember which ones. Um, but yeah, so there you go. I would, I would just go for it. You can do it. But mosaic's a nice place to start because it is slip stitches. If you are like, no, I want it to be stranded. Um, hmm. What would be a good stranded first? Um, oh, I'm blanking. I am, I am blanking. Hmm. Maybe I'll think of one before the end. I have quite a few, like I have um, the Spark Hat, um, but it does have some kind of bigger floats in there. That's why I like the Mosaic, because it tends to be, you aren't dealing with the same floats as you are with Stranded, generally speaking. Uh, but yeah, if I think of one, I'll throw a link below, but I'll definitely link those Mosaic ones for you. All right. I have adapted the throw over to knit for each of my grown sons and they fit beautifully. I'm so happy to hear that. My question is, if I wear a certain size in one of your patterns, will I wear the same size in all of them? I thought that was such a great question. Um, generally speaking, yes, but it's not a hard and fast rule. <laughs> Um, for instance, I just wrote a new pattern that's going to come out this spring, which I sized for both men and women. Um, so there's going to be 20 sizes available and it is the first time I generally wear a size two in all of my patterns. By the way, the numbers in my patterns do not correlate to number patterns that you might see in a ready to wear garment. If you're typically a size two, that is not the same as a knitting pattern. Um, it's just, that's the position you're gonna follow throughout the pattern to find your specific instructions for that size. Um, but in this new pattern, I actually am going to do the size three. So I say, yes, generally, if you aren't going to pick that size, you're probably gonna pick one on either side of it. So I still think it's a good landing point. And then I would check out ease and the styling of that garment. Um, but I definitely think that you can always kind of start with where you generally are. So I would always, if I was looking at my own patterns, I'm always gonna to jump to size two and then kind of decide, okay, well, do does that ease work for me? Do I wanna go a little bigger or smaller? Um, and I have, I've knit different sizes in my patterns before on either side of the one I usually pick, depending on the finished style I want. And this actually segues quite nicely into the next question. I'd like to know how to figure out positive ease. So I have answered this one before, but I get it so often. And I think it's one of those things that like, it bears repeating. I think it is a trickier concept and I don't think it hurts to review it again. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do this one again. Um, so they say, say I'm a 44 inch bust and the pattern calls for six to 10 inches of positive ease. 
Do I go down a size or two if I don't want it too baggy? Or is the ease already figured in that particular size? Thank you for your help. So I cannot speak for all patterns. When I answer questions, I am going to speak about my own because <laughs> that's what I know. But for me, the I have the number of sizes. So let's say it's one through nine. And that is just so you'll see it's like size one and then two through five are in the first set of parentheses and then six through nine are in the second. And those numbers just correlate throughout the pattern so that you can find like that you always are looking at the second number within the parentheses or whatever it may be for your spe specific instructions for that size. But below that, on the details page and on the pattern pages, you will see finished bust or chest measurements. That means the finished measurement of the sweater, not of your body, because you're the one who's gonna determine how that finished measurement would work for your finished measurement, your measurement, not your finished measurement, your measurement. So if you're a 44 inch bust, and I'm just gonna round up because that seems easier. Well, let's see about this. So you're a 44 inch bust and the pattern calls for six to 10 inches. You, it sounded like, didn't really want the 10 inches of positive ease because you don't want something to be too baggy. So if you did want 10 inches, you would actually look for the size that's finished measurement. So you can look on the schematic or on the details page that has a finished bust or chest measurement of 54 inches, which is 10 inches larger than your bust. But if you are like, I feel like that's gonna be too big, I do think it is good to go close to what the designer has envisioned for that pattern. So if they're giving a nice range, like six to 10 inches, you might wanna to go to the lower end of that range, so six inches. So 44 plus six is 50 inches. So for you, you would wanna look for the finished measurement of 50 inches to have the right amount of ease um, for your size. Now, yeah, so there you go. Because you say, do I go down a size or two? So you would look and see, is there a 50 inch finished um, chest available for that pattern? And if there's not, that's when you also have to look like, let's say there's only a 48 or a 52. So then you have to decide, okay, do I want a chance going less on ease, even though that's not what the designer recommends, or do I want to go up those extra two inches so I'm still falling within the recommended ease for that pattern? So I hope that helps. So basically find out your chest measurement and gener generally um, designers are talking about your full bust. So measure over the fullest part of your chest or bust. And then that is the measurement that you will add or subtract ease from and then find that number within the finished measurements or the closest number to it. So I hope that helps. Just to play the other side of that coin, um, I don't see as many, I guess I don't write <laughs> very many negative ease patterns. I'll definitely do some no ease. Um, but let's say you were looking at a pattern that is negative ease, just so we can give an example of that too. Let's go ahead and keep our 44 inch bust. And let's say that the pattern recommends two inches of negative ease or five centimeters of negative ease. Um, you would just subtract the two from your bust measurement, which here we have 44. So you would look for the size that is closest to 42 inches for the best fit for you. Um, of course, your own style comes into that and what ease you like best on your body, depending on the style of that garment. All right. So we got a little spinning, spinning coming up. This is a spinning question. I'm a brand new spinner. I've heard you say you enjoy rewinding your singles before applying them. I've never applied yet, but will soon. How exactly do you rewind your yarns from the bobbin? And then I actually have two questions about this. Um, okay. Sorry, I was just reading. <laughs> I 
was just reading that to myself instead of to you. I wanted to see if I needed to write, read them separately or if it would behoove me to read them together. Um, but first let's just talk about why. Because the second person who asked a very similar question said, um, doesn't that rough them up? So no, um, basically the whole purpose of it for me, the reason I do it, um, and I have two skeins here that I did it for, is that if you think about, so you have spun your singles onto your bobbin. Um, oh, I have some over here. Got a little basket of bobbins over here. Okay, so you have spun your singles up onto your bobbin. And if you are using a worsted draft, let's say short forward or short backward, um, as you are spinning your singles, you are smoothing the fiber as it is going onto your wheel. Now, when you go to ply, if you don't rewind, you are now going to be going in the opposite direction that you spun them. So if you think about it, so I was pushing this way the whole time I was spinning on for my singles, I was, you know, pulling, smoothing that out. Now as I ply, it's going the reverse way. So I'm actually roughing it up by going in that direction. So when you put, when you um, rewind your singles onto a spare bobbin, it is going to keep it in the same direction so that as you're plying and again, moving your fingers over that yarn, you are continuing that smoothing motion instead of going the opposite way, roughing up those fibers. So I was just curious about this because I had seen it um, on different little, you know, spinny videos I've watched. And so I just wanted to see if it would be worth it. And I actually think it is. I really like, and there are other reasons, by the way, to do this. Another reason would be if you are not so great about moving your um, flyer, like whether it be hooks or a little slider, if you're not great about moving that, then you can get these like peaks and valleys on your bobbin, which can then collapse and cause issues when you go to ply. Another reason why people would do it is they will actually wind their singles onto smaller bobbins, like weaver bobbins, in smaller amounts, and then kind of mix those all up before plying to end up with a more consistent ply because from start to finish of your spin, your consistency might vary. So by kind of mixing them all up more before you do the ply, you're gonna end up with a more consistent overall yarn. Um, but the main reason I do it is the smoothness I like, but really it's the color. <laughs> it's the color. So what I, I also like, especially if I'm doing like a fractal or even like a standard um, ply of a painted braid, when you rewind your bobbins, move those singles onto a new bobbin, you're gonna end up starting with the same end you started with when spinning your singles. And I find that I like how that color placement, it like it starts it off on the right foot. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons I really like to do it. So here is two example skeins. So this is me trying to spin thicker. I am quite a fine spinner, but I have got to say, I am really enjoying these thicker spins. It, they're just so plumpy. I, I'm like, these make me so happy. Am I gonna all of a sudden start knitting with much heavier weight yarns? I don't know. But here's one I actually just finished yesterday. So I'm hoping to use this for something for my son. Um, so this was a braid that I'd had in my stash for a while. It is Targi, I believe. Um, and it's just, yeah, it was really fun. I just spun this one fractally. And then this was, I believe, I think I did a standard two ply for this. And I don't remember. I might have, I've shown this one before. I might have said what was in it before. Um, but this was my first kind of thicker spin. And so I rewound the bobbins for both of these. I have decided, I think what I might start doing is before 
I put my hand spun skeins away that I'm not quite quite ready to knit with. I think I'm actually going to knit up a little swatch to go with them because I just firmly believe that you need to knit your hand spun to know how it's going <laughs> and what you like and what you don't like, especially when playing with color and everything. Um, so I would like to start doing that. Side note, <laughs> in case you want to join me on that endeavor. Um, so how do I do it? Ooh. Okay, so I like to use these storage bobbins. This brand is called Bobbins Up. There are even more inexpensive ones than this that I actually recently found. Um, these are like between five and nine dollars, I think. Five and ten dollars. Um, the nice thing about these is if you have a hand drill at home, this is like its own little system. So you can use a hand drill, that bit end goes into your hand drill and you can use this to re-spin your, um, to move your singles from one to the other, from your first bobbin over to these. Um, so that's why I think these ones are a little more expensive. There's also like cardboard ones that are cheaper and then weaving bobbins are even cheaper. They're just smaller. They aren't going to have these big ends on them. They have like little shorties. They can't fit as much fiber. So what I use, um, is the quill attachment to my Hansen mini spinner. So this actually just goes into the orifice of the mini spinner. And then you can just turn it on and you put the bobbin on here. And you can find demos of this, by the way, totally online. But you just put this on here and you just feed your singles doo -doo -doo -doo, back and forth until it's all full. Um, so that's how I do it because I already had this and then I found out that they sell this quill attachment and that has been fantastic. I think one of the reason, reasons why I've been kind of good at doing it is because I have the ability to do it. That is easy. It's not a whole other chore. Um, but again, this can be a great system if you already have a hand drill at home. Um, there's also like hand crank ones. And um, so there's different options out there that I would check out. I don't know how much a hand crank one would be in comparison to kind of going with this route if you already own a hand drill. Okay. Um, oh, and I think that was part of the other question is they wanted to know where I got storage bobbins. Um, so I got these from the Woolery. They have, they're a massive, um, they have a massive supply of spinning stuff. They have wheels and everything. So um, that is where I got the bobbins up ones. But there you go. Okay. I think besides that, it's just a little show and tell. I do have one last skein to show. Oh, I had a few questions asking about those, um, the knitting barber cords. I did put a link. So in the last episode, episode 50, um, I did put a link to these, uh, but you can just, if you just search the Knitting Barber, you will see um, a, quite a few LYSs, local yarn stores do sell them. Um, sometimes they sell quickly, so sometimes they're sold out, but um, you can definitely just check it out that way too. I just linked to a shop I had bought them from before. All right, so this is my other show and tell. Last week I shared, I was working from a bat from Artifacts of Appreciation and combining it with a braid from Port Fiber. And I am so happy with how it turned out. I was so nervous the whole time. Again, we kind of talked about using those precious things and that fear of like, I don't want to waste it. And what if this isn't a good idea? And the inner turmoil of a maker. Um, but I am thrilled with how this turned out. I actually have two skeins. They are still drying. This is actually kind of still damp. Um, I don't even know if you can see its true color. It is these beautiful, can you see that blue? Barely, it's like this beautiful sky blue and then there's also orange. Some of it gets a little ochre. And then with that Tweety bat, I just, I could not be happier. I already am like, what 
can I do next? Um, so anyways, I'm very excited about these. I finished applying them yesterday, hence why they're still a little damp today. And I will see what I'm going to use this for. I'm kind of thinking a shawl. Um, I still have one braid left of the Xanadu, which is the, was the colorful braid, not the bat that I did with this. And I even thought about plying that one up, um, spinning that one on its own so that there was kind of a bright version and then this subdued Tweety version, but I don't know. We'll see. We will see. And I finished my socks. I actually forgot to <laughs> picture for the last couple days. I finished these over the weekend. Last weekend was my kiddo's midwinter break. Um, so we had, I tried to take a couple of these off to be with them. And I was like, all right, I got to finish my socks before everyone else in the knit along finishes. And I'm going to be the only one who doesn't finish my socks. Um, but I am super excited with how they turned out. I love the subtleness of this colorway. It's so beautiful. Um, so I'll let you know how they wear. Again, this was 100% Dorset from Akara Yarns. And it knit up really nice. It was super squishy. I think I told you all last week about how I used the wrong size wrong size needle uh but I got back on track and I still have a decent amount left so I had 90 grams to start with and I have not weighed my little cake but um and I knit these ones fairly tall so yeah I'm super stoked to wear them they're dry they're ready and they just need some beauty shots so I can share in the knit along forums but I think that's it we have Two knit alongs going on right now. The DRK March to May knit along just kicked off this week on Tuesday, and that is for sweaters and shawls. And I know a few of you have been asking about the shift cowl. Unfortunately, the cowl does not fall into either of these categories, but last year there were a lot of people who wanted to knit some smaller accessories, and so we ended up doing an accessory knit along over the summer when it's kind of nice to have smaller knits. Um, and so I might do that again if there is enough uh, people who want to do that. So if you are interested in an accessory knit along, definitely let me know in the comments below. Um, but otherwise this runs through the DRK spin it to knit it knit along. <laughs> I didn't realize until just now that that's like two knits almost in a row. Um, goes on through the end of March, I believe. Should look that up. Um, so it's not too late, even if you just want to join in with some sock yarn from your stash, you can absolutely still join in. And then the DRK March to May, um, we have some really, really great prizes. If you haven't checked those out, you can head over to my Instagram or to Ravelry to see what the prizes are. Um, and yeah, we would love to have you join. It's really fun. It's a great place to make friends. I made one of my best friends in the world uh, at a knit along years ago, right before I started designing and we are still very close. So I think it's a great place to form friendships around a craft, especially if you're like me and you don't necessarily know a lot of knitters in your area. Um, it's a great way to meet people, even if they don't live close. So I guess that's all. I hope y'all have a great weekend. I hope you get in some spinning or knitting or sewing or felting or embroidery or cooking or baking or any of those things that just fills you up a little bit and brings you a little joy. Um, I think right now we could all use it. So thank you so much for joining me and I hope to see you back here next week for a full year of these episodes. I think next week will be it. All right, have a good one. Bye.